Good afternoon and welcome to today's session, the IIoT Ready PLC, your journey from the edge to the cloud. My name is Natalie Meeker and along with my colleague, Dan Freeve, we will be your moderators for today's webinar. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the presentation, please post them in the Q&A section to the right of your screen and we'll answer them throughout the presentation or during the, during the Q&A segment at the end. I know we are all very excited to hear from today's presenter, Patrick Corcoran. Patrick is a project director for DMC with over a decade of industry experience. Patrick's software career has emphasized data collection and integration with physical systems. As IoT and IIoT solutions continue to change the industrial landscape, Patrick's broad experience in device platform and data-driven applications support unique insight into solution readiness, which drive <coughs> investment decisions and deploy strategy. I'd like to pass it over now to Patrick to take us on this journey from the edge to the cloud. Thank you so much, Natalie, and welcome to everybody who's joining us this afternoon. We're glad you're here, uh, and I'm certainly excited to be covering today's topic on the IIoT. Um, this is a really exciting time for DMC and certainly exciting time for all of us as we start to take a look at these uh, web-based applications and starting to get our industrial equipment more interconnected and and intermixed with our everyday life. So again, welcome in and thank you for spending the afternoon with me and the tiny version of me. Uh, I'll be in and out of the presentation throughout. Uh, as Natalie said, please, as we go through this content, feel free to post questions live. Uh, we'll break it a couple of points throughout to uh, review questions we get in the chat, um, as well as spend a little bit of time at the end answering those things. Hey, Patrick, I hate to interrupt, but it looks like your mic got muted for a second. Apologies. Let me. Let me roll back there real quickly. Good afternoon and uh, welcome in. I appreciate everybody taking the time and I'll just quickly run through the intro again. My name is Patrick Corcoran. I am a project director in St. Louis for DMC and appreciate you spending time with me and the tiny version of me uh, for this presentation here this afternoon. At DMC, we are a custom systems integration and software development group. We specialize in a number of different software solutions ranging from manufacturing automation, embedded development, digital workplace solutions, test and measurement, and more traditional application and web development. What's really exciting for us about the IIoT applications is that it's a sort of perfect crossroads for DMC as we approach problems from both the factory floor as well as problem solving in the web and IT spaces. So as we see these applications unfold and the IT infrastructure meeting the OT requirements in manufacturing, uh, DMC feels very confident and, and is excited to be very well positioned to serve the needs uh, that we'll be seeing in the IIoT. We've been in business over 20 years and are privileged to have worked on over 4,000 projects with thousands of customers deployed throughout the world. We're proud to have grown to over 180 employees throughout the US. As I mentioned, I'm located right in the middle there in St. Louis, Missouri, but we work very hard to try to meet our customers wherever they might be uh, serving our clients uh, from coast to coast. We're very proud for the kind of partnership and, and sponsorship we worked with on this presentation today. Siemens has been working with DMC for, for our entire existence, and we are, we are happy to have the largest number of Siemens certified engineers in the US. And in particular, we cover uh, the myriad of products and service offerings that Siemens provides. And as it relates to the IoT discussion today, we're certainly going to be focusing in more on those PLC automation platforms, uh, as well as touch on the MindSphere IoT operating system. So again, thank you for taking the time this afternoon. I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy and uh, doing their best under the current circumstances, but we're glad you could take a few moments of your day to to talk about the IIoT. 
we're going to start off and cover kind of what is the IAOT, um, give some parameters, some definitions, some understanding to kind of what DMC's uh, outlook is on the IAOT. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords out there in the world today, and we're going to we're going to give some foundation to sort of what we're discussing here this afternoon with the industrial Internet of Things. Uh, most importantly, we want to get to why is this important? Why is this something we want to consider uh, for our systems, for our manufacturing environments, for our customers even? Um, what what are the kind of primary drivers to move toward these types of investments? Furthermore, we want to talk about kind of a l touch on at least a little bit of the how we go about connecting industrial equipment to our cloud-based solutions. And then lastly, we want to kind of take you through a compare and contrast of given the nature of the IoT and the IoT, how do we sort of orient ourselves in understanding what is the best solution for our application or for our manufacturing center? So what is the IAOT? I'd like to usually start with a quick revisit of history here um, and, and talk a little bit about the Internet of Things at large and how we sort of arrived at the industrial Internet of Things as, as a frontier, as a, as a place technology is growing and a lot of folks are investing in. <clears throat> this all started in the early 80s in, in congruence with the, the rise of the Internet as we know it. But in the early 80s, a team at Carnegie Mellon first connected a Coke machine to the network. Uh, they found it paramount to keep their caffeine needs met. And the first thing that they wanted to do with their newfound network and connectivity power is dispense Coca-Cola, um, which is exciting for us all now uh, because as we see as things unfold, really the Internet of Things is all about the conveniences that it affords us. 1990s, what I call the toaster tipping point. This is the first time a toaster uh, was connected to the, the first documented time a toaster was connected to the Internet um, and thus making the Internet of Things better than sliced bread. Har har. Um, but really, the word Internet of Things came from a gentleman by the name of Kevin Ashton, an MIT professor and later uh, uh, corporate leader at P&G. He spent a lot of his time discussing and talking about RFID technology, and he was the first person to coin the term Internet for Things, which was simply predicting the notion that the internet and the web as we know it wasn't going to exist to really serve our our meaning people's needs anymore it was going to exist as infrastructure to allow devices to automate to interconnect to communicate with one another and ultimately start to perform a lot of the tasks that people would otherwise be doing on the network and on the web um, Better marketing minds prevailed and Internet for Things was sort of co-opted to Internet of Things. And that's how we kind of got to the terminology that we're all used to today when we talk about interconnected and Internet connected devices. Ten years on, still 2008, we, we hit a significant milestone and the general fulfillment of Kevin's outlook on what this infrastructure means and what we're doing with connectivity and that is to say there were more devices connected and present on the internet than there were people on planet earth and this includes smartphones and all sorts of other sensors and devices uh, that are more commonplace now uh, but we hit that tipping point almost 10 years ago which is more than 10 years ago which is quite amazing which brings us to present time and looking out at 2020. And as we do this on a live webcast and some of you uh, watching this particular session within your browser uh, as uh, with our current work from home uh, conditions. And it leads me all to say that our expectations as engineers, as colleagues, as human beings have changed in terms of how we interact with electronic devices and, and the technology within our lives. And I think this change in expectations, this fundamental acceptance and, and again, requirement that things are available on our mobile devices, in our web browsers, immediately, no matter where we are in the world, uh, this 
shift in thinking is what's bringing forward the industrial internet of things and the IIoT uh, as we see it now. If we all think about kind of our own lives and how we interact with these devices and with the internet of things, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Rogers bell curve. This is this is a model for kind of how technology is adopted into the marketplace and uh, consumed by customers uh, and people alike. And just by show of chat, if I could ask uh, the moderators for a quick quick hand here, if you want to hit the like button here, uh, please hit the like button if you have a Google Home, a Nest thermostat, a Wi-Fi connected garage door, uh, any kind of smart device, an Alexa uh, that you currently use or rely on day in and day out. And as an open-ended question, I would bet that there's there's many of us here all listening today that that have those things that are a part of our lives and will continue to adopt and use devices in our consumer lives uh, that are interconnected and web web enabled. And for that reason, I'd say the consumer electronic space has really entered a later majority uh, with the rise of smartphones and the things that we're seeing kind of enter into to our everyday use. Uh, there is hardly an electronic device that gets released to the market today in the consumer space that is not connected to the web, doesn't have a command companion application for your phone or mobile device. It doesn't have a web experience. These are fundamental requirements to reach consumers and reach customers today in that marketplace. Conversely, if we compare the inner the industrial Internet of Things and you asked me to kind of place where's the adoption curve? How are companies uh, positioning themselves? Where are they on this sort of journey to bringing web enabled technologies to industry? I would say it's still very early. And that's fairly expected. When we look at industrial applications, industrial systems, the level of investment that's required, the amount of, of years of life we expect from industrial devices compared with consumer electronics, we're typically comparing something on the industry side that has a minimum expectation of 20, 30, 40, 50 years operating life versus a consumer device that we really only expect to to have a one to five year life cycle uh, if that. So there's a lot of good reasons why industry maybe hasn't jumped in with two feet and sort of been at the forefront of adoption of some of these technologies. But I am here to say, following the lead and following the over 40, nearly 50 years now of development in the internet infrastructure, the Internet of Things technologies. Now is a very good time to be looking at the state of these tools, the state of the market, and evaluating your strategy for meeting those ever rising expectations. If we break this down to, to the fundamentals, what we're really looking at is connecting industrial equipment to web-based services in the cloud. And I think a lot of us have seen diagrams like this, iconography like this that that really describes at a in a very high level what this ecosystem looks like. We have an industrial device, let's say a Siemens PLC. We have a cloud service provider where some magic happens that uh, sometimes it's hard for us to understand. And then we have our mobile experiences, our user experiences, the thing that's right in our pocket or in our web browser that we're actually tapping in and looking at. But if we peel back these layers a little bit and talk more specifically about what this cloud piece is and what these web technologies are, we're, we're talking about platforms like Mindsphere as one particular option, as, as an Internet of Things platform. This is a whole cohesive ecosystem of services that can be used to develop applications. But we're also talking about maybe some of the other uh, cloud providers that you're familiar with from the IT space or business space uh, that, that are now pervasive in the marketplace. These are the Azure's, the AWS, the Google, uh, 
I didn't pick these three for any particular reason. There's also IBM Cloud, Oracle. Uh, there's there's a rich marketplace of cloud hosting and cloud services platforms um, that are driving the web and mobile applications that, that we're all used to consuming today. And what's really exciting about now for the Internet of Things is that we can we can now directly begin to integrate our edge devices as industrial equipment, our PLCs, with these cloud hosted providers, uh, which unlocks a lot of power for the types of applications and user experiences we can develop. So what does this mean for our businesses and why, why does a business or a group choose to invest in projects, choose to enter into the marketplace or develop these web experiences for their clients and customers? If we can make a few statements about kind of impacting the bottom line or developing that ROI picture, I'd, I'd enter the first one for consideration is there's a quantifiable cost to the way you're doing business today. The, the way your current support model works, service model works, the amount of money, time, energy, effort it takes to reach your customer base and or the, equip, the equipment operating in the field quite literally uh, is, is a significantly high cost, uh, operating cost year in and year out. And this is something that cloud enabled technologies, the ability to enable remote access, remote work, remote monitoring, are directly designed to address. These are the types of gaps that they're built to close. Another one that we're all looking for in our business, no matter uh, what type of industry, what type of application, machine, etc., that we're all looking for, is to continue to add value for our revenue generating activities. And without web-based experiences, without affording our customers, our clients, our user bases, the conveniences that they're used to in web and mobile, uh, sometimes the value add, sometimes the ROI picture gets a little bit thin, especially if we're marketing and selling and, and delivering quote unquote high tech services or products. So this is something in order to make sure that we continue to establish ourselves as leaders and continue to, to add value, in our business engagements, web and mobile experiences are innately a part of that. IT and OT automation, this is similar to kind of quantifiable costs within operation, but I think one thing that hits home for the industrial space in particular, because of the amount of, of infrastructure on both sides of this fence, on both the systems that drive ERP and business intelligence, um, meeting the systems that are networked and the heavy automation systems that we see in factories and plant floors. There's been significant and independent investment that's gone on for many, many years on both sides of this fence. And some of the cloud solutions and the types of interconnectivity that is exciting about IIoT is that we are bringing these two things closer together than they ever have been before. And we're not necessarily jumping through six, seven, eight layers of conversion and translation. Uh, we can bring these two things together uh, in very convenient and very scalable ways to improve these types of automation challenges. And I would say all of this, uh, especially the value added services, but all of these things you know, we're doing this to continue to differentiate our products, our services, our brand in the marketplace and continue to make sure that we are taking advantage of the conveniences and the operational efficiencies as technology leaders. I, I don't think anybody listening to this call or uh, that is in the industrial space would suggest that technology and good investments in the right technology are fundamental to to ensuring profitable operations and efficient operations. Um, and this is, I think the spirit of this discussion, especially with IIoT, is taking a look at what are those, what are those technologies that we should be looking at and, and how can they be best utilized uh, to help improve my position. 
in addition to sort of the business sense that goes behind those impact statements and why we're approaching and adopting and investing in these particular types of applications. We also want to talk about some of the technical features that are the benefits of moving to the cloud. And when we talk about kind of web and mobile, I think the quintessential example that we're always looking for that maybe starts as the basis of discussion for any type of application in this area is or is the combination of two things here, remote monitoring and control, being able to be at your home, on the road, anywhere in the US and have access, have the secure access to monitor and even potentially control a processor application to, to more efficiently help customers connect and, and save time in our own lives. Um, that is also coupled with alerts and notifications. These are always usually going hand in hand, which is that remote monitoring is nice, but we, we don't always wanna be just staring at it on our phones and being the first line of defense, so to speak, when it comes to any kind of issue or detectable anomaly. Um, alert management and push notification support is, is one of the fundamental building blocks of a good uh, web infrastructure for IIoT. So, couple of couple of technical features here in in that these are the sorts of of technical building blocks we're trying to assemble into a into a singular application. So to put a finer point on this, I want to explore a quick case study that DMC uh, had the privilege of working on. We collaborated with a company called Ag Agra Inject. Uh, they're a group that develops irrigation irrigation and nutrient dosing pump systems uh, for agriculture, for, for the farming industry. And this particular product that they've developed is really hitting on those sort of fundamentals of remote monitoring and control, push notifications, and taking advantages of the cloud convenience that we're looking at. So um, what does this mean for them and their customers? It means we've got better maintenance capability, easier troubleshooting of these field devices. And we'll see in just a second, and as I'm sure you can imagine, in the agriculture space, uh, the time and energy to reach some of these places can be significantly high. So the web and the cellular driven connectivity uh, is, a, is a huge part that underscores the success of this application. We get better user interface options and functionality. Probably everybody here that's in that's familiar with industrial HMIs or uh, perhaps older SCADA systems that you've interacted with, you'd probably admit right now, if we all just take a moment, consider it, internalize it, and think about it, that the HMI screens that we see on our factory floors or connected directly to a pump are a far cry from the UIs and, and user experiences that we have in our iPhones and our Android phones that are sitting in our pocket. What's really neat about the IIoT and about kind of marrying the industrial control capability with the power of the cloud and the web platforms is that we can get those grade A user experiences, ease of use, clean design, we can get we can take advantage of the best of both worlds in the sense that we have reliable, robust control out in the field, but we also have convenient, easy to use, accessible uh, information in our pocket, on our computers, at home. In addition, especially with these types of remote monitoring systems and the types of scheduling and, and dosing, that alarm notification, that push notification, email and text alert, continues to allow them to differentiate their business and their ability to respond with service information and support for their customers, especially in the middle of the growing season. It, it differentiates Agri-Inject, it differentiates their product in the marketplace, which is a huge advantage. As I mentioned, I think the agriculture space, the types of scale of this deployment in terms of just geographic location probably only rivals oil and gas if we're if we're really honest about kind of how dispersed how intermixed uh, these types of systems could be and so having the ability to quickly look in 
see the state, see the activity of these devices, see even where they are at specifically uh, is, is a big advantage to bringing these technology packages together. This is a quick picture of the actual pumping system itself. So the, the box on the right hand side uh, is what is deployed in the field. Again, taking advantage of PLC based control technology married with uh, cellular connectivity uh, and then all brought to life by the web experience on the front end. It gives us a nice way to be looking at the state, the health of the machine, historical information about the performance, as well as giving us some direct control capability, uh, which is the ultimate convenience instead of having to be in the field to make fine tuning adjustments uh, to the irrigation cycle or to the nutrient dosing that we're looking at here. And again, especially in industry, we get a lot of questions about the investment in these systems and probably the number one thing that we see, and while everybody likes to collect lots and lots of data, um, data collection is great and we all need to use it and digest information uh, and capitalize on that intelligence and that insight. What a lot of us are looking for, especially in the controls apparatus, is that ability to actually affect change on the device. And so, this is a resounding yes, we can deploy systems with two-way communication, not only monitoring the health status and collecting uh, large sums of data from these types of devices, but also being able to tap in and control and make adjustments to the way the system behaves in the field and in bringing this all together remotely. Building on that sort of fundamental set of building blocks and, and fundamental example of a, a highly distributed device with remote monitoring and control with, with alerts and notifications, we can take that sort of same model and we can actually build additional benefits on top of that. So what do we, and this is feeding with what I was just saying, which is what do we do with that real-time information when we get it? How do we make intelligent decisions that are impactful to our businesses, improve our services, improve our customer experiences? Another case study I'd submit that, again, building on what we just saw, DMC partnered with a waste management company to develop an IIoT solution for trash compactors. And in the wonderful magical world of trash, which I'm sure we all spend lots and lots of time uh, thinking about in our daily lives, you can probably imagine that the only time customers truly deeply appreciate trash and the services surrounding trash is when it's a problem. It's when it's overflowing and it's it's spilling out onto our feet or our streets or behind our businesses. And this company recognized that as being the core tenant of success for their marketplace. How can they optimize their services to ensure that we don't have overflowing trash, that the customer experience is excellent, and that their business operation is as efficient as possible? And when we look at deploying a web-based solution to address an issue like that, I think we want to look at a few things uh, as, as as the requirements and in, in the subcomponents of an application development. The first is predictive maintenance. And in this case, we're talking about support for scheduled pickups and, and optimization of the schedule and of our operating procedures. In, in this industry, there's sort of two choices. We either operate a completely regular schedule, even though customers will fill these bins at different rates, or we have the intelligence, we have the device and ability to operate an on-demand model and even trend and predict when those demands will be so that we can fill out our schedule uh, days or weeks or months in advance um, based on usage statistics. This is pretty powerful for anyone that has any sort of system operation with any type of consumable in it. And I haven't figured out the right word for the for the waste management with the reverse consumable and a accumulator a uh i don't have a good one for that but if you have systems that that operate on the basis of regular maintenance routine maintenance 
consumable level monitoring or checks, this type of ability to monitor, predict, schedule, and control your operating costs and operating decisions, this is huge. This is huge for improving profitability. This is imp improving employee satisfaction, uh, improving customer experience. These, these are all huge benefits to, to operating a successful business. This drives as a big component of it, especially with the on-demand, significant annual cost savings for this operations company um, as they don't have to dispatch folks on a regular basis. They have very uh, well understood controls and, and well thought out pricing models for their services. At a technical level, moving to the cloud type solution also gives them the ability to scale. And this is something I'll bring up again uh, more in the closing side of this discussion. But when the industrial Internet of Things, when we look at an agri inject with the agricultural pumps, when we look at this waste management example with trash compactors, sure, we could be talking about hundreds, maybe in the low thousands of devices that get deployed uh, throughout the US, throughout the country. Uh, perhaps throughout the world. And when we talk about machine design in industry, we're usually talking about true realistic volumes. If we look at a one to three year time scale uh, of let's say hundreds of devices. What's really cool about the fact that the consumer area has sort of pioneered the cloud infrastructure and some of the interconnectivity tools that go on here is that they think on a scale that is so much larger than that. They think on on terms of hundreds, tens or hundreds of millions of active devices and users. What's So what's really awesome about these technologies, about adopting technologies like this is that they are able to grow in size and shape and scale uh, to really help support your business needs and how you might want to operate. To take a look at a quick user experience example, this was one that, again, web-based, mobile-based, gives their end customers and clients the ability to go in, understand the usage statistics, and gives them as the operator uh, the ability to understand the machine performance and behavior and also manage that scheduling operations. Uh, again, kind of like the example of the pump system and probably from our own experiences with, with industrial technology, we can really streamline the user experience to make this information as easy as possible to digest and to act on. Now, some of you may be saying, OK, great, distributed systems, remote locations, awesome, that's cool, but I operate a factory or I have a few facilities. Um, those types of applications don't really fit my needs or sort of the style of adoption. Uh, what would be what would be some other benefits on the industrial side if I'm operating a process uh, or an assembly line, for example, or more in the discrete manufacturing world? Um, <coughs> Some other technological things we think of when we shift to more that that end user operator operations model is uh, as follows. I think we think of the diversity of equipment we'd want to bring on board. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with with SCADA type applications, which which can pair very well, and we'll see in just a second with with IAOT solutions. Um, <clears throat> A lot of us have uh, equipment of various ages, of, of various deployments, um, and we may not have the mobility to sort of do a ground up product design like we saw with the last two examples. So uh, what do we do if we have pre-existing equipment? How do we uh, take advantage of, of some of the, um, how do we take advantage of these tools when I have uh, maybe devices that are 5, 10, 15 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, I get a little worried, 40, ugh, some of it's going to be a little bit hard, but what do we do with existing infrastructure? And then how do we limit the impact on the business, especially deploying technology packages like this? Um, we need to make sure that this is limited interruption. Um, 
as as one case study here, DMC worked with a food and beverage manufacturer that operated over 36 lines of, of various sizes and shapes um, and of various vintages. And as I was just saying, this is a particularly good example of pairing the capability of a good SCADA platform, in this case was WinCCOA, uh, and, and the ability to reach that diverse pool of devices uh, with the power, the convenience of the web platform, and that's where MindSphere came in. And because of the size of this information, because of the, the diversity, because of the amount of data being collected, um, having a IoT platform built at that scale uh, for the data collection and analysis, uh, like some of the tools that are baked into MindSphere, uh, was really important to to be able to ensure we could digest this and distill the information that was important, um, uh, like the line runtime and in general uh, manufacturing performance. What were the benefits of doing it this way, of sort of pairing these two technologies together, of being able to use SCADA information as well as uh, the IoT web experiences. The first was we were able to do this without downtime on the production line. Because we're using the SCADA applications and because we were able to, to take advantage of the, the variable methods of communication, we were able to tap into all of these different devices regardless of the age or protocols that they were speaking on the ground. This led to very efficient commissioning and testing because again, we're looking at a no code solution when it came to the equipment that was actually already installed and operating. Um, so it gave us a very convenient way uh, to tap into this information, test it out and get the information flowing to the web. Uh, that said, because of the time to deployment, because of the ability to take advantage of the turnkey solutions in these platforms like MindSphere, this was a very cost effective approach as opposed to maybe custom development. And we'll unpack that in just a second. This also gives us tons of flexibility for future changes and the ability to tweak bringing on new devices. Um, so onboarding new parts of the line or new sensing activities. Um, we, we are built on a very generic set of tools and a generic platform, so it is very malleable to change as the needs of this line and this solution uh, shift with us. Before I step into connecting to the cloud, I want to just take a take a second and uh, review questions. Um, Natalie, do we do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, Patrick. Yes, we do. Actually, we have two. Um, the first one, how do you address customer concerns of security, especially with two way communication when there are controls that can be used? That is a great question, and I'm going to touch on security here in just a second with the connecting to the cloud. So I'm going to table that and would happily revisit too in the Q&A if uh, it's not addressed there. Wonderful, and then we have one more as well. Are there options to deploy at my facility? What if I don't want to go to uh, want to go to a cloud service? Yes. Yeah, so what's really cool about a lot of what's been going on with the web technologies and, and in the IT space surrounding that is these solutions are very portable. Uh, a lot of the types of things that we use and, and for those familiar uh, uh, with, the, with some of these IT infrastructures, uh, there's this concept of containerization. There's this concept of sort of packing up applications uh, as as standalone, very portable features. And those types of containers and the types of technology that we use and deploy to Azure or AWS, our ability to shift between different cloud providers, that, that level of portability also implies that we could bring these things very easily on premise. Um, it's something we get asked about frequently. Uh, in in warrants consideration and discussion in certain cases, I would say that the benefits of having a cloud hosting provider, uh, it's it's really important to look deeply at how what level of maintenance and care you want to take on on that on-premise solution uh, before totally discounting using the cloud. 
These are great questions too, and I and I really do. I will uh, be touching here briefly on the security question here, um, but we'll also stick around after uh, if if more detail and we can unpack that a little bit further. So let's dive into the cloud connectivity, and I want to revisit our uh, our quick model here for our industrial controllers our cloud services provider, and then our user experience as our three kind of big high level moving pieces here. And again, these are the these are the core services, the, the MindSphere, the Azure, the AWS, Google Cloud, whatever it might be. Behind the scenes of a web application, and I'm just showing this is a, a high level example of the type of architecture DMC uh, has very successfully deployed. And, and if you looked at those couple of case studies, this is a very similar model uh, to what's driving Agri Inject, for example. But we have our industrial controller and we need to get that information to the cloud. Some of you may have already heard the acronym MQTT, it stands for message queue telemetry transport and but what it actually means is it's a communications protocol. It's a very neat communications protocol that was purpose built for the Internet of Things, which is really awesome. And what's even cooler still is that we can support this now in our industrial controllers in our industrial applications, which give us direct web connectivity. This protocol is managed by something called a broker. This is a piece of software or a service running in the cloud that allows for neat features like one to many communication. This allows us great scalability when it comes to say having 50, 100,000 devices out in the field that we need to, to communicate with. Um, MQTT was actually pioneered uh, by some folks in the oil and gas industry developing embedded sensors along pipelines uh, that were spanning a huge range, huge range of geographic region. And the protocol was designed to support a few requirements that are that are key to the web. The first is that we're deploying to devices that might have limited computing resources. And I know we'd all like to believe that our, our PLCs are all powerful and the greatest things that have ever been de deployed or built uh, in computing technology, um, but they still, you know, max out at 64 megabytes of RAM or something like that. Uh, it's really not a lot. It's it it is a limited computing resource. MQTT is awesome because it's designed to be as lightweight as possible to run on all sorts of devices. So this is very cool. Another thing it allows us is very efficient communications. The structure is very light so that if we are riding over a bandwidth limited network, another way to say that is cellular uh, or bandwidth limited network. Another way to say that is we're paying for every piece of data we're sending across it. Um, having a well optimized solution to sending up, packing up and sending only the information that's important to us uh, is an incredibly powerful tenant of the MQTT protocol and of this design pattern. And I would love to trust, you can ask my colleagues, ask Natalie or Dan, uh, whatever. I would love to spend at least two more hours uh, actually diving into every nut and technical bolt of the MQTT uh, design pattern and protocol and what it means and, and how it's changing the world around us. Um, the format of this the, this presentation isn't going to allow me to do that, but I will say that we have started that technical discussion already. So if you are left looking for more on MQTT, maybe specifically maybe how to do it with the Siemens uh, 1500 and 1200 controllers, we've got some info and and some great next steps here for you on that. The first thing is that native support. So Siemens has introduced an MQTT library that now is supported on their PLC controllers, the 1200 and 1500. It's really awesome because now we're talking about direct connectivity. There's not a protocol translator. There's not uh, additional middleware that's needed to support these types of activities. It makes it a very, very powerful edge computing target, especially with the robustness of an industrial controller. And uh, 
again, for those interested, we did another web series just last week in partnership with Siemens. There's a live how-to guide in TIA where we actually open up the software and build this thing from scratch, uh, setting up a controller to talk to a cloud-hosted web application. To the question about security, and we probably will in the future do a more detailed uh, IoT security uh, deep dive, but what's awesome about MQTT built on the TCP stack and what's even neater about some of the latest updates in the Siemens 1200 and 1500 controllers is that we can apply SSL encryption to our protocol transfer. We can do certificate managed encrypted traffic from our, end, our, our edge device targets to our cloud hosted environments. And this is, this is the modern standard for encrypted web traffic. So if you visit any website and you look in your browser and you see the little shield in the upper left corner, um, that is talking about the fact that you are using an encrypted communications connection with a third party independently verified uh, certificate chain. These are the same security tools we deploy directly at the edge, directly in our devices to pack up and send our information to the cloud. So to address the customer concerns about security, um, I would I would say very simply, uh, if you if you currently bank online, if you shop online and do purchases, um, we probably all are using Amazon or something of the similar uh, to to do purchases these days uh, on the web. The same fundamental security standards that are used to protect those transactions, which you hold dear, are the ones we're applying to protect our process data, our engineering data, and our control set points. <clears throat> um, there are certainly additional steps we could take, and again, this would unpack a much larger IT discussion, but regarding security uh, at a fundamental level, we're using SSL and TLS encryption for two-way communication from our edge device to the cloud. So that's where I'll leave it off on security, but I'm happy to stay uh, after for a few minutes here and certainly answer more questions as they come in uh, if on that topic in particular. So to try to put all this together, and we looked at a couple of different case studies and, and different use cases, and I mentioned MindSphere throughout and Azure and Google and some of the other cloud providers. And I'm sure a lot of folks in, in this room and, and in this audience are, are thinking about other IoT solutions that they have uh, heard of or considered. And kind of what's the process DMC goes through, especially when we're collaborating and partnering with our clients to fit the right solution? How do we pick the right choice for these types of application developments? And if I kind of put these into two buckets, I would say that there are there are two sort of fundamental models of application that we looked at here today, actually. The first is sort of our <clears throat> facility level, line level, what I call a high diversity type industrial application. These are gonna be the things where we have many different machines, pieces of equipment, and we're trying to cohesively look at information across the board, across all those different platforms, products, and, and things that we're using in our process. On the other hand, we have high specialization. For those that are machine builders, OEMs, um, or as we saw with, with the industrial products that we looked at in agriculture and waste management, uh, these are highly specialized, purpose-built design designed products that were taking advantage of these cloud technologies in different ways. I'd say there's a whole gradient of middle ground in between these two. But if I were to start to form a spectrum and and put orient you on one position or the other, on one hand, we'd have highly diverse uh, edge devices, highly diverse types of data and information that we're collecting. And on the other, we'd have highly specialized, very purpose-built uh, types of solutions that are going out into the field. The first thing I wanna reiterate again is 
I discussed it during a case study, the number of assets, if we consider custom solutions, highly specialized solutions versus package solutions like MindSphere and others, um, we wanna first consider what's the size of our fleet? How many of these things are we actually gonna need to manage and, and how easy is it for me to set up, manage those things and scale with those things? Again, to underscore the awesome part about the cloud and web is that they think on an order of magnitude different than what the industrial IoT application typically consists of. So while we may be thinking in terms of hundreds of or thousands, uh, typical web technologies are gonna think on millions to hundreds of millions. So both, both ends of the spectrum have the capability capacity to support large installations, very scalable installations. When it comes to connecting and configuring our devices, what's the user experience like to onboard new assets, to bring new devices online and quickly get set up and communicating uh, with these targets? On a package solution basis, I put that at a medium to high. There's a little bit of difficulty. There's some extra special rules and things that we need to pay attention to when we set up those deployments. That is because those package solutions are looking to support that diversity of different types of things. So there's many more options. There's many more configuration settings. There's a lot there's a lot of additional care that is that is put into those solutions as a design point to cover the many different edge cases and scenarios that they could encounter. On the other hand, custom solutions, because we're talking about a purpose-built web experience, we can make sure that the user experience and the ability to onboard a device, like in the waste management example, is extremely easy and straightforward. And we can take advantage of the fact that we know what our fleet looks like very specifically, and we know what our customer use case is very specifically, so we have a tailored solution. We can bring that connect and configure difficulty down to a really low level. Protocol supported. Package solutions, again, many. It's reaching out. It's going to try to, to touch and speak to as many different types of devices and targets as we can possibly uh, manage. On the other hand, in custom solutions, I wouldn't discount that selecting a protocol like MQTT, for example, is a very limiting move. Custom solutions can still reach out and touch an entire world of devices, and especially looking at MQTT as a pervasive adopted IoT standard, that's going to give you tons of flexibility in what types of edge devices you can connect, be it PLCs, embedded devices, or other off-the-shelf solutions. Analytics is always a hot topic in the cloud, and I would posit that largely in the IIoT, a lot of us are still building this strategy about how to get the relevant information to the cloud, but if you're somebody that's on the head of the curve and you've done that, and now you're also looking at how do we go about capitalizing on this ocean of data we've been collecting? Do I need machine learning? Do I need AI packages? Um, I'd say both at the packaged end of the spectrum, as well as the custom end of the spectrum, you're looking at significant investment. Something to be careful of, in, in both cases in evaluating the right platform here <clears throat> is understanding what happens to your data depending on the type of analytics package that you're using, who owns it, what the cost is to move it around. Um, on the package solution side, those are going to be fairly rigid definitions of, of how that works and how much it costs. Um, whereas on the custom solution side, we're going to be a lot, we're going to have control of of where and how uh, that data is managed and stored, and we're gonna have much tighter cost controls on uh, usage information uh, related to piping that data from one service to another. Um, so analytics, I wanna, I wanna be very clear that in both cases, uh, takes significant effort. And probably the more important thing to be focused on right now, I would say as an industry, is getting the information to the cloud. Um, once we're there, there's a number of options and all of them take effort to deploy successfully. User experience, this is what I've been hammering on throughout the discussion <clears throat> in how we take advantage of these technologies. Package solutions, 
good user experience. There's really intelligent, great designers putting that stuff together right now, and they are crafting the best ex user experience they can, given the diversity and general nature of the applications that they're building. That being said, a custom solution, great user experience. This is brand specific, user specific, application specific. We can limit it down to the minimum number of clicks, touches, or otherwise a user needs to interact and get started with a particular application. If user experience is a driver for the success or failure of your project or product, you should heavily consider a curated custom developed solution. And the moment we've probably all been waiting for, uh, just to, to, and some have probably already assumed maybe what this model looks like, but I'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least touch on how much does it cost? How much can I sort of understand uh, the cost picture for these types of selections? On the package solution front, as you might imagine, low upfront cost. There's a lot of turnkey things developed for you. You might not like exactly what those behaviors are, but they're done <clears throat> and not something you need to invest in. Low upfront cost. As a result, those platforms and products are built on a recurring cost model. So the cost to continuous operations, to onboarding more users, devices, number of tags, pieces of data, all of those are gonna add more and more and more to the recurring cost in the, in the maintenance of the application in the long run. Conversely, on the custom solution side, you're not gonna have as much out of the box uh, uh, options already built up for you. So there is some investment in getting some of the basics of an application put together for your particular system. This might include things like user management, which are not really something you necessarily care about uh, from an industrial operations perspective, but something you absolutely need when it comes to making a cohesive web experience. So there's higher upfront cost in deploying a custom solution. That being said, there's many value engineering decisions that can be made along the way, the types of services that are selected and how they're deployed and used, we have tight control of, and we can drive the overall maintaining and operating cost, recurring cost model, to a very low level uh, within the cloud ecosystem. So again, depending on the fit of the application and just to understand where sort of the energy, the time and the investment comes in the custom solution, we're looking at more upfront investment with low recurring cost versus the packet solution, low, low upfront, high recurring cost. This table just brings together the summary of the information we went through um, to, to try to put it all together into, into one side-by-side -side view. Uh, certainly more information can, can be gathered from dmcinfo.com uh, if you're interested in unpacking kind of this side-by-side -side comparison a little bit more. So what can we do? What do we do now? We've looked at a few different case studies. We've looked at why businesses take this, take this step, take this journey. We look at the different types of solutions, the spectrum of solutions that are out there and the types of areas we look to configure and invest in and get started in. I'm here to emphatically say DMC is here to help. If you're somebody that's looking at, at taking the next step in one of these investments, we'd love to talk to you and help orient you within that spectrum and discuss what of the many options might be very good fits for your application based on our experiences. We showed just a few selected case studies here today. We certainly have many more that we'd be happy to share, um, but we, we are here to help you and we would love to be in partnership with you to help develop these solutions. If you'd like to learn more uh, with some independent study, these links will come out in a nice thank you email and follow up to this webinar. So we'll be sending them out uh, here just shortly, but we have the complete guide to planning your IAOT solution. Uh, it's a, a nice web series we put together to expand that list of questions to, to really start to refine the requirements for how to go about deploying these applications. 
Furthermore, I mentioned previously in the in the presentation, but we have a nice live TIA demo for the Siemens users out there. Uh, how do we go from blank PLC to live web application? Uh, we've got a nice 30 to 45 minute demo on how to do that. You can check it out at the link below. And also, if you're interested in more of the DIY road, uh, the Siemens MQTT library will send that out as well, uh, mentioned here in the presentation, if you'd like to start playing around with these technologies on your own. And all that said, again, uh, wherever you are, I hope you are safe, happy, healthy, enjoying your week. We do appreciate you taking the last hour to spend with DMC. My contact information is here. Please do not hesitate to give me a call, shoot me an email, uh, reply to the webinar invites. Uh, if you do have any questions, we are more than happy to answer. So all that said, I will I will ask uh, to the moderators, do we have any questions in the last minute or so here? Awesome, thank you very much, Patrick. If anyone would like to stick around for a few extra minutes, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one, can I use PLC SIM Advanced to test MQ MQTT working? Can you suggest MQTT broker address for testing purposes? Uh, sure, on the PLC SIM Advanced, I believe the answer is yes, though in my personal experiences, uh, I have been using a lot of just physical uh, 1200 devices and 1500 devices we are lucky to have in our lab. Um, as long as TCP communication is available within the, the advanced simulation, uh, the MQTT uh, library should function correctly. Um, in terms of testing your application with an existing broker, uh, an open source one that has a publicly available broker is called Mosquito by Eclipse. And I will reply in the chat here uh, with a specific link to that for you. So you could take a look um, so if you're looking to test your own MQTT application, uh, Mosquito is a is a nice uh, readily available one you can use. Another question that we had, um, are there other ways to connect to field devices besides MQTT? Uh, there are, I would say uh, most of those when it comes to the industrial space are the types of protocols that we're all used to. Um, if we think about the OPC UAs, the Modbus TCPs, um, Prof Profinet, Ethernet IP, um, those are all network based protocols that are available to us for device connectivity. Um, all of those in their own way are going to be kind of heavier, potentially more verbose um, than what comes standard with MQTT. So they may not be as good of a fit uh, for web-based deployments, but are certainly options. Wonderful, thank you, Patrick. And we have one last one. Um, what happens if the communication link goes down? Will the live data be lost or will it buffer and send when the communications are reestablished? That is a great question and a very cool part of MQTT and how uh, brokerage works and particularly how a concept called quality of service works. I would highly, highly recommend you take a look at our webcast on the TIA how to guide. I unpack the technical features of MQTT a little bit more and discuss quality of service and what that means for devices. So we'll be sending that link out in follow up here. Um, but in summary, uh, as a developer, you have control on how to treat each data point. So if it's a control signal, for example, uh, we wanna be very careful about how that information is sended. Um, conversely, if there's a just constant broadcast status from the device, we may or may not need to be as careful if one uh, packet or one message gets lost in transit. Um, we have a ton of control with MQTT on on how to direct this traffic and how to direct this information. That's a great question though, and and do check out the TIA how to broadcast because um, we do explore MQTT in further detail. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. It looks like those are um, all of the questions that have uh, come in for the Q&A. That's great. Um, thanks, Natalie, for your help. And again, thank you to everybody. Uh, we do, uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for the time. Um, any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask and follow up emails will be out to all of you soon. So thank you and have a great rest of your week.